So I think we'll go ahead and start with the, the lecture presentation. Um, my name again is Priscilla Luke. Um, I am a new assistant professor at Loma Linda, um, now as I Institute. Um, and it's my second time speaking for this conference, so I'm very excited to be here. Um, I have no financial disclosures. <laughs> I'm not working in consultation with any eye cosmetic companies. I'm just letting you know what I found uh, has been very helpful, at least with um, how I take care of my eyes. Um, so some of the things that I thought we'd talk about today, or I'd talk about, um, are the harmful effects of digital devices on your eyes, because everybody's using a digital device now, um, whether it's an iPhone, a Samsung, um, an iPad, a mini iPad, a computer, or watching TV. So um, really important to know what effect this has on your eyes. And then what is Blink Cosmetics? Um, this is a new uh, vegan oil-free um, revolutionary eye cosmetic that's out on the market now and um, a lot of ophthalmologists are approving this product because it's safe um, for your eyes. And then the third thing is um, how is cataract surgery performed? Do, does anybody know? Does anybody know how it's performed and how quickly and um, efficient the surgery is? It's really not as bad as some people think it is. And then um, for those of you interested in refractive laser surgery, do you think you're a candidate? Do you have all the qualifications um, that would make you a good LASIK, PRK, or um, um, patient that might need an enhancement if you've already had LASIK? And then at the end, we're gonna do a raffle drawing for a Latisse sample. Um, and Latisse is an eyelash enhancer uh, that can be used for pretty much any patient, but I'll also talk about the side effects um, that may be um, detrimental if you, if you um, develop some of this um, hyperpigmentation on the skin. And then I handed out a few um, papers on uh, quiz questions, so uh, be on the lookout for maybe answers throughout the talk that might help you uh, remember some of the take home points. So here's a cartoon. Um, the patient is coming in for an eye exam, and the doctor is telling him, you know, your eyes are just fine. It's just that some eye charts are, the type is too small, so you can't <laughs> see it very well. And it's essentially saying nearly blind, leading the nearly blind. Um, so some tips for healthy eyes. When you wear sunglasses, make sure um, they're UV protected, of course, and they're polarized because polarized lenses allow the light rays to bend at a certain, um, certain degree to protect your eyes from harmful rays. And um, the, the type of lenses that you want to get is a blue filter coating on the lenses of your eyeglasses. The blue filter, um, it will protect the radiation that's emitted from a digital device. So that's really important to know. Um, of course, having a healthy diet, eating lots of leafy green dark vegetables and dark berries for antioxidants, very important. And I did hand out a couple of samples of refresh eye drops. Those are really good to moisturize your eyes, to keep them from being dry, especially in Southern California. It's very dry here. Um, skin gets dry, eyes get dry, so make sure you use artificial tears to help your eyes, um, you know, prevent them from being dry. And then it's always a good idea if you're doing a lot of near work, a lot of computer work, um, to take breaks so that you relax the accommodation that your, your eyes are doing for you. Um, so, you know, look at the mountains, look at trees, look at something far away. Yes? On your handout, you say here that you should eat cold water fish. Cold water fish, yes, because Can you what that is? cold water fish, so like salmon, uh, mackerel, um, those types of fish are helpful because they contain omega 3 fatty acids. Now, you can take a fish supplement, a fish oil supplement, and that will help, or an omega 3 um, supplement as well. Um, and make sure, you know, it's handy to have a little bottle of saline solution, um, whether you're cooking, um, whether you're doing some kind of activity where you might have a chemical splash in your eye, really important to have that available in case that does happen, really irrigate the eye well. Um, when we have patients come into the ER um, and they have a chemical splash, we uh, irrigate them for at least 20 to 30 minutes straight through. Um, and then uh, avoid aggressive eyelid rubbing and moisturize the corner of your eyelid skin to avoid wrinkles or crow's feet. So um, really important to do that. 
So digital devices, do you love them? Do you hate them? What was your take? How many of you love digital devices? <laughs> and how many of you hate them? <laughs> A few? <laughs> Okay, so we all know that this is very prevalent in our society. It's a great tool for magnification for patients who can't see very well. You can magnify it if you're a low vision patient, you know, if you have macular degeneration or you have glaucoma. It's really great because you can enlarge that print. Um, it offers you a clear, crisp display, which is great. Um, and it's an interactive, engaging learning device for school-aged children. A lot of kids now um, in school have iPads and doing a lot of their work with the iPads. And it's convenient and very portable. But, um, you know, we're doing research now that show that it's increased um, significant in eye strain and eye fatigue. So something called computer vision syndrome. Um, and that can lead to an acquired myopia or nearsightedness where the, the thickness of your lens starts to increase. Um, patients are getting dry eyes because they're not blinking as frequently. Um, the average person blinks about 18 times per minute. And so when you're doing near work, that rate decreases by about half and your eyes get more dry, they get more blurry. Um, and then there's the effect of the electromagnetic radiation and blue violet light that will damage the photoreceptors in the back of your eye in the retina. And so when that's damaged, there's an earlier onset of macular degeneration. And then, of course, the light from the devices, there's a disruption of the circadian rhythm. So patients will get insomnia, they'll get disrupted sleep patterns, and um, you know, we recommend if you're gonna go to bed and you want to avoid a disruption of your sleep pattern, to just turn the cell phone off, 10 o'clock, turn it off, and then just sleep for your eight hours. Um, and this slide, uh, didn't you, does anybody know who this is? Who is it? Yeah, it's Audrey Hepburn. She's a, kind of the classic, I think, iconic beauty in Hollywood. But this, this slide is just to show you that, you know, at any age, whether you're young, you're middle age, you're, you're older, that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So I think that's really important to, to take away. And so lots of different eyelash enhancements out on the market. Of course, everyone knows about mascara because it's, um, you know, everyone can get that over the counter. Lash extensions. How many of you use lash extensions? Are, are there any of you that use lash extensions? How about mascara? Mascara? Okay. <laughs> Is everybody today wearing mascara? <laughs> um, and then Latisse. Do you guys know about Latisse? No, okay. So Latisse is actually um, a medicated eye drop that was initially used for patients with glaucoma to lower intraocular pressure. And um, it actually strengthens your eyelashes. It makes them thicker, longer, darker. So it gives the effect of mascara, but it takes about three months or so to kind of work. Um, a lot of celebrities have used it. And then there's a peptide serum. So the peptide serum is something you can get um, without a doctor's, no, uh, doctor's prescription. Um, and peptide is basically the building block of protein, which is responsible for your hair, hair growth. Where do you get the pep peptide serum? So you can order it online. You can go to Amazon. You can Google it. Um, there's different, um, different brands. So Chella is one brand that um, was... Uh, promoted at Huntington, at the Hyatt in Huntington. They had a Pamper Me Fabulous event where uh, there was a booth that had Chella eye products. And how do you, how do you spell that? Chella, so C-H-E-L-L-A. And you can use that instead of mascara? And you can use that instead of mascara. Mascara is not good for your eyes. Yes, it coats it. It's really sticky. Mm -hmm. But there's tar products in it? Yes, there are tar products. So it, uh, even when you're trying to remove the mascara, and especially waterproof makeup, you know, it's, it's so adherent to the eyelash, and you're scrubbing your eyelids to get it off, um, and it's very damaging to the skin around your eyes. So the peptide, you don't have to do that. Depending on, and I'm going to talk about the, the new Blink Cosmetic product. Uh, I'll, I'll, ta I'll talk to you about that. One last question. Mm -hmm. Permanent makeup? I have some patients with permanent makeup, like the eyelet, um tattoo, yeah. Um, it's not bad, but it's just when we're doing surgery, we're kind of like, hmm, it's not coming off when we're trying to clean the eye. But it's okay. I had, my doctor told me it was better because he said the products have so much hard, the rubbing. Yeah. He said it was better that, that you had the permanent makeup. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and but then sometimes the um, it fades, so it doesn't have that dark. You know, if you wanted a dark look, like a dark eyeliner look, it kind of yeah yeah. <laughs> over time, it kind of fades. So 
Um, again, the pros and cons of eyelash enhancements, aesthetically pleasing in society. Um, it, can, it can boost your self-confidence and your self-image. You can see the picture here um, of a person without um, eyelash enhancement and with. And then obviously the cons are smearing eyelid irritation, eyelash loss, hyperpigmentation, and then the cost and maintenance of kind of keeping this up. So Latisse, um, the actual product name is called Bimataprost. Um, and like I said, it's used for glaucoma patients. Um, and it, it, what it does is decrease the amount of fluid production inside the eye, so the eye pressure becomes lower. But a side effect is that it, it prolongs the antigen phase of the hair cycle growth. Um, and I said, you know, it takes about four months to work. These are the different phases of the hair cycle growth. Um, and it's the antigen phase, the first box on your left, that is prolonged uh, with this product. And again, celebrities like Claire Danes and Brooke Shields have used it with good success. Um, the top photo shows them without treatment, and then week 16, or about four months later, you can see the growth of the eyelash. Uh, the same again for Brooke Shields as well. The clinical studies have shown that lashes get thinner and shorter and lighter as we age. And this can begin as early as age 30, which, which uh, frightened me because I'm 33. <laughs> so I was like, oh no, my eyelashes are getting thin. Um, but you know, if you use this product for a good three to four months, um, you will get thicker, longer, and darker lashes. And can you go to your doctor to get it? You can. Actually, you can come to the Loma Linda Eye Institute. We're at the FMO right across from the medical center. We do have the product, and um, today we're doing a raffle for the product. So I think, did everyone get a raffle ticket? Good. Okay. So we'll, yes. Yes, yeah, if you'd like to have that, you know, that look, you can definitely keep, keep using the product. And then if you stop, correct, yeah, because that, it promotes the hair growth. And if you stop, then the hair just kind of, you know. Yes? Is this good for contact wearers? It's good for contact wearers, yes. Yes. I don't have a ticket. Oh, you don't have a ticket. Okay, Jason's going to get you a ticket. Okay. He's coming right now. <laughs> All right. So um, now the side effects, you do have to be aware. Um, the side effects include eye redness. So you can get some redness of the white part of your eye if you're really sensitive to the product. And the skin around the eye can also get a little bit darker. Um, you can get a little bit of itchiness and even the iris color um, will change, can get darker. So if you have a lighter colored eye and you like to go darker, <laughs> this is the product for you. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and they actually have laser treatment now. I think out in Newport Beach, uh, somewhere along the, the beach area, um, they're offering laser treatment for patients who want to go from you know, green or blue colored eyes to kind of a grayish color. And they, you can actually do laser treatment for that. I don't think it's FDA approved, but <laughs> it is uh, available. Um, and then something called periorbitopathy, which is kind of changes around the orbit. The orbit is what surrounds your eyeball. And research, clinical studies have shown chronic use of um, glaucoma medication um, can cause a deep sunken eye appearance. That can be good, that can be bad, depending on how you feel about the way your eyes look. Um, and the proposed mechanism is that this medicine decreases the fat content in and around your eyes. So I actually have some patients that come in and say, you know, I've got these puffy, baggy eyelids below and above. Can you do anything for that, doctor? And I'm like, well, we can do blepharoplasty where we, we remove the excess skin and kind of give you an eyelid lift. But for down below, um, it's considered a cosmetic procedure and insurance won't pay for that. You have to pay out of pocket. But this drug um, has been noted if you use it you know, for several years, it can actually cause that fat to disappear. It's more noticeable in Asian patients. According to the study, the literature was noting, and it could be because Asian patients, the eye, they're not as deep uh, naturally, um, and so it's a little bit more prominent with use of the medication. But it is apparently reversible with discontinuation. So I guess the fat cells will repopulate um, so a word on lash peptide serum, um, peptide is what stimulates keratin production. And these proteins are what form your, your hair, basically, uh, around your eyebrows and your lashes. 
Um, in clinical trials, it increased eyelash length and thickness by 25% in only two weeks and 72% uh, increase after six weeks. And so this is um, another product called MyChell. So um, that's also available. Um, you, could, you can find that online and order that if you're interested. And I think Bed Bath & Beyond carries something very similar. I think it's called Lash Rapid, something like that. Blink Cosmetics. So Blink Cosmetic is actually a very um, new product line. If you go to blinkink.com, B-I-L-N-C-I-N-C.com, you can look at their website. Um, they offer waterproof, smudge-proof, flake-proof eye cosmetics. Um, it's a vegan product. There's no gluten. Um, there's no oil-based paint. It washes off with water very easily, and it avoids harmful um, harsh eye makeup removers, uh, chemicals that can be very toxic to your eyes and around, in and around your eyes. It avoids harmful eyelid rubbing because you simply just wipe it off with your finger and, and water. And it's ideal for people with sensitive eyes, who wear contacts, even who wear glasses because it won't smudge on your lens, on your eyeglass lens. And so this is what the product looks like. And this is, how it, this is how it works. It was manufactured in Tokyo, Japan. And the active ingredient, it's not a peptide, it's called an acrylic copolymer. And what it does is it forms a tube sleeve around the eyelash. So each eyelash you have, the, the um, product forms a little tube. And then how do you remove it? Well, when, the, when you wash your face, the water coats the tube and it neutralizes its product. So the tubes then slide right off. And you can see evidence of that on, on the finger there. You know, just wipes right off. I was using, using this product myself, and um, I see an esthetician for my skin. And um, she was like, well, I need to you know, wash off your makeup. And as she was going on my eyelashes, she's like, oh, you definitely don't have waterproof uh, mascara on. <laughs> and I told her, this is Blink Ink. This is a Blink Cosmetic. It's the new revolutionary eye um, cosmetic that's very um, safe for your eyes. You don't have to rub it off. It just comes right off. Um, so they, they include um, eyelash mascara, eyelash primer, eyeliner, eyeshadow, brow mousse, um, hair trimmers, heated curlers, um, and brushes. And what you would do is put the mascara on first and then use a heated curler to, to really curl the hair, just like you would with your own hair. You know. There are gift sets available online, so you can check out their, um, their website for, for more information. Um, so that's kind of the outside of the eye. We're going to start talking about the inside of the eye now. And when you go and see your doctor, are they checking for cataracts, glaucoma, diseases related to diabetes? How many of you in the audience have diabetes or high blood pressure? A couple of you. So really important that you get your eyes checked for diseases related to that in the back of your eye because if the diabetes is poorly controlled or the high blood pressure is really poorly controlled, those blood vessels in the back of your eye can bleed, they can leak, they can grow new blood vessels, and that can cause changes in your vision. Also, checking for macular degeneration, um, retinal tears and floaters. Floaters are little black spots or like hair-like um, um, distortions in your vision that should be checked for. And usually that's um, done with a dilated exam. So an optometrist or an ophthalmologist can do that. Yes? Well, I've had floaters for years. Mm -hmm. and they just, you know, yeah, they can drive you crazy. Mm-hmm. Yes. And, uh, it can make it worse, actually, after you have the cataract surgery. Yes, it, because the, the cataract is removed, so that haziness is gone, and then you have a clear implant, and now everything's brighter, and you see, you see a lot more, and you'll see those floaters even more prominently. Unfortunately, they haven't um, developed a laser treatment or anything to you know, like zap the floaters. I wish they did, because I have so many patients that come in and say, what do I do about these floaters? And all I can tell them is, you kind of have to live with it. Um, your brain kind of gets used to it in certain conditions. You kind of forget about it. So mind over body, I guess. <laughs> but I have them too. I actually have more in my left eye than my right. And I only see them when I'm at an intersection because I'm just kind of glazing and looking at the blue sky. And then I just see the floaters floating. And then everywhere I look, I see them. <laughs> it's the most annoying thing ever. But your brain kind of learns to adapt to it with time. What about the study with macular degeneration? 
Well, there, um, there actually is, I guess you could, um, I mean, there is a laser, it's called PDT, and what it does, um, the ophthalmologist or retina specialist will inject a dye in your vein. That dye travels up to the back of your retina through the vessels. And then they use a camera that um, shines a light that fluoresces that dye, and then they use a laser to, to pinpoint the areas of leakage of the, the vessels. And that can stop the process of blood and, and fluid leaking out into the macula. Um, so only certain doctors do that. Um, I think Dr. Rouser, he's our chairman at Loma Linda, he offers that treatment. There's a doctor out in, I think it's Palm Springs, his name is Richard Pesavento with the Southern California Retina Consultants. He also offers that treatment as well. And it depends on the degree of macular degeneration, generally kind of recalcitrant um, cases that um, have the exudative component or the wet component will benefit from the treatment. And so it's called PDT. PDT. Mm -hmm. um, currently, I get the injection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's. I, hate that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Nobody likes to have a, a needle in their eye, <laughs> but that's that's kind of what's you know the last couple of years. That's the most common treatment now is um, injection of either Avastin, um, uh, Lucentis or one of the newer drugs is ILEA. And if you fail treatment to Avastin, um, Lucentis, then ILEA is actually available now. In Canada, they actually do um, Lucentis more. So I get the Avastin, mm -hmm. but I could be a uh, candidate for PDT. for PDT. Yeah, check with your retina specialist to see if they offer that for you. Um, so, oh, so this slide was going to talk about causes of a red eye, and you know some patients come in, they've got a bloodshot eye, and they just they panic. You know, I was at work, and somebody told me, you know, it's your your eye is red. What's going on? You're bleeding from your eye. You are bleeding, but it's more like a superficial bleed, like a bruise on your skin. Um, it doesn't really uh, affect your eyesight. It's just. Either you, you have very fragile blood vessels, you're deficient in vitamin C, or you are rubbing your eye or straining, and that can cause a blood vessel to pop and then cause this red eye appearance. It's called a subconjunctival hemorrhage, which is essentially benign. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. It just looks hideous. And then it goes away in about 10 days or so. Um, other causes of a red eye can include blepharitis, so kind of congestion around your eyelashes, the oil glands that um, form your, your tears, um, allergies, allergies can cause red eyes. Um, if you have a growth of tissue in the corner of your eye that gets really inflamed in the summer or in dry environments, that can cause a red eye. Corneal ulcers, so if you're a contact lens wearer and you don't uh, adhere to strict lid eye uh, hygiene, you can get a corneal ulcer. And actually, contact lenses are the number one causes of um, bacterial keratitis or corneal ulcers. So really important to watch out for that. Um, iritis or uveitis, which is inflammation inside the eye or in the wall of the eye, can cause a red eye. Um, and then acute glaucoma or really high pressure in the eye can cause a red eye. And what about Visine? How many of you use Visine? Something similar, yeah. yeah. Every day, do you? How often do you put the visine in? I put. I, actually, I don't use visine now. I use Bosch and Lam. Uh huh. Every day. Every day. Do yeah. you do you use it frequently throughout the day or just once? I use it mostly when I get out of the shower. Okay, so just in the morning. Yeah, or whenever. Or at. Okay, that's fine. Um, what it is, is it's a vasoconstrictor, so it, you know, it makes your blood vessels get tiny, so they're not engorged. Um, so it does get the red out in that manner, but um, actually, if you use it chronically, um, you know, when you constrict your blood vessels, you're not getting enough blood flow to the essential parts of your eye. So you're actually depriving your eye of oxygen and nutrients that are actually helpful. It's just like exercise. When you exercise, you want the blood flow to go in and around all over your, your body. And so the same thing with your eye. Um, lumps and bumps, um, you know, that can vary from skin tags to a blocked oil gland that causes a chalazion, which is like that red bump you see on the upper left-hand corner, um, to even skin cancer. So um, really important to have these checked out. Um, I do a lot of excisions in the clinic where um, if a patient comes in, let's say they have a skin tag, we can just snip that off. 
Um, a Chalazian um, is a little different if it doesn't respond to medical management, which includes hot compresses and massage to kind of really release the oil um, out of the gland. Um, then we can do either a steroid injection um, or an excision where we clamp the lesion, we flip the lid, and then we kind of lance it and drain it. Um, the bottom picture is an example of basal cell carcinoma. Um, it's the most common skin cancer in and around the eye, but um, as long as you get it taken care of, um, I think you should be just fine. We can do a simple excision in the clinic um, just to take care of it and send it to pathology. And a lot of derm cases, um, they'll come to us if it's in around the eye and we can excise it. If it's really extensive, I have seen some cases where it involved like the entire lower lid. It was black and blue and growing all, all over the place. We sent that to the Mohs specialist, the Mohs surgeon, and what they do is take slices of the, the tumor until it's negative and there's no more cancer, and they do it right there in the clinic um, upstairs at the FMO. So eyelids. This patient has droopy eyelids. I I think this is a male, um, and you can see it is so severe that it's um, obstructing his pupil, the dark part of his eye, all, more so on his left than the right. And so, you know, this patient is less severe. Um, it, you can see the pupils, um, but it's still pretty heavy. It's resting on her eyelashes, and that can be troublesome for patients, it, you know, if they're driving. Um, and they can't see on the sides, they can get into a car accident, you know, so it's really important for, for them to come in and be evaluated. What we do if, to see if you're a surgical candidate is we um, do a visual fields test where you're sitting in a machine, it flashes um, a bunch of lights in the top part of your vision, and then we simulate what surgery would be like, so we tape the lids up. And when the lids are taped up, you take the test again. If you see more than 30% of those lights, then you have an improvement in your vision, and your insurance company should cover for the cost uh, of a blepharoplasty. Um, and this one is, is an example of a patient who's had that done. You can see the contour of the eyelid is better. It's lifted up. Um, the procedure is about a 45-minute um, surgery. It's done outpatient. We, I use uh, dissolvable sutures, so you don't have to have them taken out. They just dissolve in the skin after a couple of weeks. Um, and um, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty straightforward procedure. I have a question. Mm -hmm. My daughter has congenital ketosis. Yes. Um, so her eyelid droops. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, how? But she's only seven months old. Uh-huh. Um, have they done any? Surgical intervention, or well, yeah, but not on her eyes. Um, on the so eyelid. Question, mm -hmm. Is that possible because of her age? Um, so she's how old? Seven, so months. seven months. Yeah. So her visual system is still developing, and it's really critical for um, the eyelid to be elevated so she doesn't develop amblyopia, which she is she has. Yeah. Okay, so they need to work on um, getting that eyelid lifted up so the. Um, so the image forms properly on the retina, and if it doesn't, then she's going to have kind. Of, she may develop a lazy eye in the future, where it, it starts to drift out if the vision isn't corrected. It is. It's a term for when the vision doesn't develop fully to 2020. So if she gets to 2040, 2050, that's kind of an amblyopic eye. Yeah, she, I mean, she she's a she's also been diagnosed with CBI and then um, optic nerve hyperplasia. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's going to that's gonna limit her visual potential. Um, the vision with the optic nerve hypoplasia, if, if her vision is already decreased, then she will most likely not be able to get to 20-20 vision. In the future, they may be able to develop, you know, right now I know at USC they're developing stem cells and electrodes that are implanted in the retina to to you know, let the, the, the light rays come in and stimulate the retina. So patients with retinal degenerative problems can actually start to see motion, whereas before they wouldn't. So maybe in the future that might be available for her. Okay, so is, it's not a cosmetic procedure? Then? Oh, no, 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 not at all. Okay. Not at all. Would it be this one? Oh, blepharoplasty? Yeah. Um, actually, she would probably have a frontalis sling, which is actually um, a silicone tube that is hooked from the eyelid up to the forehead, and that would raise the eyelid. Because in her case, a congenital condition, the eyelid actually, it, it's deficient. It doesn't work anymore, so they would mechanically move the eyelid up. 
And they do that for, um, for kids who are born with very low set eyes. Uh, so um, she sees an, a pediatric ophthalmologist? Um, or, yeah. Um, yeah, she's, she's, uh, she was born here at Loma Linda. Oh, okay. So she may benefit from seeing an oculoplastic surgeon, um, Dr. Wee, H-U-I, um, Dr. Isaacs, or um, Dr. Vidor, Ira Vidor at um, Inland Eye Institute. So Dr. Vidor? Vidor, uh, V-I-D-O-R. Dr. Wee does procedure? Um, silicone sling. Silicone sling. Mm -hmm. Or a frontalis sling. Okay, so, so she was talking about ptosis, yes. Is your covered under Medicare? Yes, it is. Okay. Yes. Okay, um, so ptosis repair is exactly what we were discussing. So this patient, on the patient's right, you can see a drop of the eyelid over the pupil, whereas on the left, the pupil is clear, clearly visible. The same thing with the patient on your right. That eyelid is, is drifted down, and with surgery, the eyelid is lifted up. Other causes of um, eyelid irritation can be the eyelid droops, uh, flips out or flips in. Um, this can cause a constant tearing down the cheek or a foreign body sensation or a chronically irritated eyelid. And you can see that um, representative photos at the top and then actual patient photos at the bottom. So this one on the lower left-hand corner, the eyelid has flipped out and the redness of this, the conjunctiva is due to chronic exposure to air and it's hyperkeratinized, it's developed a thicker layer. The photo on your lower right is an eyelid that has flipped in. The eyelashes are rubbing against the eye, which is causing a redness around the eye as well. And what we can do in surgery is basically throw a suture in or a stitch, flips the eyelid out, and then we can actually tighten it to the, to the bone on the outside of your eye, and that really just keeps it in place. An alternative method, if you didn't want surgery, is to put a piece of tape and just tape it out. Some people don't like to do that for the rest of their lives, so. Um, do any of you know people that have facial twitching? Yeah? So facial twitching can be caused by um, basically a nerve irritation, um, a microvascular compression of the facial nerve. It can actually be brought on by um, dry eyes, um, light sensitivity, if you have multiple sclerosis, or um, benzodiazepine withdrawal. So if you're on like Ativan, um, Clonopin, any of those, and you chronically take it and then you stop, you can get something like this, a twitching of the, of the face. But what we can do for you is a Botox treatment. So we, we do Botox, and that paralyzes the muscle, and then, um, and then you don't have that anymore. But you have to get frequent treatments every three to four months. Um, Botox is, um, it can be infiltrated in and around the, the brows, you know, to get rid of the, the wrinkles here, or just to paralyze the muscles um, in the forehead, and uh, as well as on the side of your eyes. You have to be careful with Botox because um, if the physician treats you and infiltrates a blood vessel, you can get skin necrosis, um, which is not a pretty picture. <laughs> so you want to definitely make sure your, your doctor knows what they're doing. Um, and this is a picture of what? Does anybody know? Yeah, cataract, yeah, that's right. So these are different types of cataracts that grow in the lens. The one on your left is actually a very mature cataract. It's a white, almost like rock hard cataract. The one on the right is actually a, what we call a sub, um, posterior subcapsular cataract, and it grows on the back surface of the, cataract, of, of the lens. The lens is surrounded by a capsule, and a cataract can grow anywhere in, in the lens. So that's what it looks like when we look in, when the physician looks in with a slit lamp. That's what we see. So this patient has a cataract on which eye? Yeah, the patient's right eye. <laughs> the patient's right eye. Um, we have six cataract surgeons, two uh, females and four male surgeons at Loma Linda, and we do surgery uh, right next to the medical center. Um, and then we also have a facility in Beaumont um, called Highland Springs, which is a very nice facility. The procedure can last anywhere from 15 minutes to 30 minutes, outpatient procedure. And there are different lens um, implants that we can put in place of the cataract. So that will give you a, you know, a nice crystal clear view of what you need to focus on. Um, there's a variety of implants, and I'll talk about that pretty soon. 
Um, we do the procedure basically under topical anesthesia, so just drops to numb the eye. Um, it's a very small incision that we make. It's about three millimeters, two to three millimeters, tiny, tiny little incision. And you don't need a suture to close, close the wound. Um, how many of you have had cataract surgery? Okay. Um, and, um, you know, we don't put a patch on unless um, we're afraid that you, you might, you know, rub your eye or something. Um, there's three types of lenses available. Uh, the monofocal lens is what is covered by insurance. Um, that guarantees that you have, um, you know, the standard um, distance vision. If you want a distance vision, we target your, your vision to be distance, but then you'll still need to wear a small pair of glasses, a small prescription of reading glasses afterwards. If you have astigmatism, insurance doesn't cover for um, a toric lens, so it can run between $600 to $1,000 out of pocket to correct your astigmatism. There are a variety of ways to correct astigmatism, but this is one of the ways is to have that corrected in your lens implant. And then the multifocal lens, which can range, um, you know, 2,000 and above uh, per eye, um, it makes you free of glasses. So you can, it, it's a lens that's designed to focus the light rays at any spot of, of your vision. So distance, intermediate, or up close. Um, if you don't have retinal pathology or you don't have any astigmatism, this is a good lens for you. So how do you know if you're a candidate? Basically, on the eye test, if your vision is worse than 2040, or you have significant glare, halos, or fuzziness, haziness, um, when you're driving at night or during the day, um, you just notice it's becoming very difficult to do your routine activities. Um, Laser-assisted cataract surgery is kind of the newest thing now. Um, we're projected to get that in 2016. We're um, aiming to have that machine available. It's a femtosecond laser that improves surgical accuracy. So the complication rate decreases. Um, it's not going to be covered by insurance. So it's, um, you know, there are social economic considerations, uh, financial costs is definitely more. Um, but this is kind of what it looks like under the surgeon's view. The um, computer analysis is kind of showing where the laser makes the incision. So um, at the bottom there is the main wound. On the side at 9 o'clock is the paracentesis wound. And the laser fragments the lens into little cubes. So you can see that on the right over there. And that's right before it does a capsulotomy, which is a peeling of the membrane that covers the, the cataract and gives us access to uh, taking the lens out. Um, again, this is projected to be available for patients in 2016. Um, and then for those of you interested in the implantable miniature telescope for, uh, for yourself or for family members that have macular degeneration and have failed treatment, um, this is a, a new, new technology for, for surgery. So IMT, it, it was FDA approved in 2010 and it improves the quality of life in patients with pretty much end-stage macular degeneration. It's a tiny, tiny little implant. End-stage. Mm -hmm. End-stage, so um, you failed treatment, you failed injections, there's nothing left for them to do. Um, there's certain criteria, if you meet the criteria, you can be a candidate for it. And um, it's part of the Centrist Site Treatment Program. So this was developed up north in um, Saratoga, California. And so the normal eye, you know, the, the light rays focus right there on, on the macula up there. And um, that's diseased macula. But with this implant, it magnifies the light rays. So it, it, it targets those light rays to the healthier part of the retina surrounding it. Um, the implant is about the size of a pea. It's tiny. And it's smaller than a dime. You can see that right there. Um, and then this is a patient on your right lower corner. That's the patient who's had the implant placed. Um, who qualifies? So actually the, the age has changed. Uh, it used to be 65 years of age. Now it's going to be 75. So patients, um, more patients qualify for the procedure. And basically geographic atrophy is what you see um, in that photo at the top. That's basically um, you know, tissue thinning and you can see the blood vessels very prominently, those retinal blood vessels, choroidal blood vessels. Um, it, in order to put the implant in, we have to take out uh, a naturally occurring cataract. So the patient has to have a cataract and has to go through therapy with um, a low vision specialist, like an optometrist or someone that can help them 
uh, an occupational therapist that can help them kind of start to use near vision in one eye and peripheral vision in the other. Um, again, you, don't, you can't have signs of wet macular degeneration, so bleeding, active bleeding, this is what it looks like in the back of the eye. You can't have that. Um, if you have glaucoma, it has to be well-controlled um, eye pressure, um, and you, ha you can't have treatment uh, in the past six months. The surgery can range from an hour to three hours on the table, um, and it's not your standard cataract surgery. Um, there are sutures that are placed. Dr. Gimbel, um, who, who now resides in Canada, he used to be our chairman, but he has done three patients uh, over the last two years, and they've all done very well. Um, they had significant improvement in the quality of life. One patient um, you know, was unable to reach for the telephone, was unable to see the coffee, um, coffee mug, and after she had the implant in, she was able to identify food on her plate, she was able to identify family members at the dinner table. So it was a, you know, a, a remarkable improvement in her vision and quality of life. This is what the implant looks like. Um, kind of at the top there, just with a slit lamp view, there's some sutures at the top and then a magnified view at the bottom. And that's how it sits in the eye, right in the pupil. Finally, um, refractive surgery is available at Loma Linda. We have an entire suite. Um, we have free consultation for patients who are interested. And actually, our LASIK coordinator is available at the booth today. So if you'd like to stop by and give her your name, um, she usually does screenings on Friday afternoons. Um, and it's free, so you can come in, get a full eye exam, um, auto refraction to see what your prescription is, your corneal thickness. Our technology is pretty much the, the front line. We use bladeless surgery, so it's the laser that creates the flap, it's the laser that does the surgery for you. Um, and um, this is kind of what it looks like. Basically, the patient stays in the, in the chair, um, is swung over to the left, that a suction cup is put onto the eye, and then um, the laser creates the flap. Then, once that's done, the patient is wheeled over to the right side, and that machine, then the surgeon will you know, lift the flap, and the laser treatment is performed on the cornea, and the stroma of the cornea, or the, the middle section of the cornea. And then on your right, there is, um, that's uh, wavefront technology, so um, it kind of enhances your LASIK experience and gives you crystal clear vision. And this is kind of a diagram of how you know, the measurement is taken with the wave scan, basically a map of the surface of your eye. Yes? Can you have um, LASIK if you've had RK? The same eye? Oh, if you've had RK. So RK is a radial keratotomy. Um, those were little slices made to flatten the cornea in the past. That was the procedure to help patients with nearsightedness. It's generally contraindicated. Yeah, it's generally contraindicated. Um, that's not to say you can't have 20-20 vision. We have a technician who's worked at Loma Linda for more than 20 years, and she had RK as well. Now she actually sees 20-20, no glasses. And um, it was because they were able to make astigmatism corrections in her cornea and take out her cataract, and she got to 20-20. So after you know, 20 years of dealing with poor vision and many doctor's visits, you know, she's, she's uh, middle-aged and she has perfect vision now. So. It's not to say you know you, you can't you can't have perfect vision later on in life. Um, again, so we offer a free screening consultation with Jessica, um, and we will you know do a corneal topography, look at the shape of your eye. Um, the redness in this diagram shows like a steepening, so it's like like a like when you're looking at a mountain, um, that redness is the steep peak of, of a mountain, which is a cornea. PRK is a um, a procedure that's laser, but it doesn't create a flap. It, it basically um, does the laser on top of the cornea, and it's generally indicated for patients who, um, uh, who have a really high refraction, a high prescription. Um, patients can't be pregnant because the, the vision changes, and the pupil has to be small, because if the pupil is big, then the light rays come in, more light rays come in, and then the image on the retina is not quite as um, sharp. So who qualifies and who doesn't qualify for refractive surgery? Any of these, autoimmune diseases, collagen vascular diseases, thin corneas, keratoconus, where the shape of the eye is like a cone, um, if your vision is still changing, 
Um, if you're pregnant, if you have really dry eyes, because um, LASIK can make that worse, it cuts the corneal nerves. And then high refractive errors, contact sports, um, jobs requiring high visual acuity. And you can get complications from refractive surgery. You can get dry eyes, glare, halos, um, you know, haze and scarring. But um, in general, if you are interested in any of our surgical procedures, please make an appointment to um, just have a basic eye check and we can go from there. That's the number that you can call um, or you can just dial the operator at the medical center and ask for the ophthalmology department. That's probably the easiest way to go. Um, Terry Merrick is our office administrator, so if you mention her name, they can connect you to her and she usually can get you in sooner than, than later. Um, and just want to thank everybody for coming. We have the raffle tickets, so we're going to pick... Yes? Do you um, recommend or when do you recommend a, a lutein supplement? Oh, lutein. Yeah, so lutein is good for um, macular degeneration patients. If you don't have that, then I, you, there's no need to start an eye vitamin with <laughs> that ingredient. Are there other questions? Yes? Yes. Um, yes, uh, AREDS 2 by Bosch and Loam is the latest um, eye vitamin that is very good for macular. You oh, you can get that at CVS, Target. What, what was that what was the name? AREDS, A R E D S 2. What is that for? Macular degeneration patients. So it, it has antioxidants, it has vitamin E, vitamin, you know, it's got all the good stuff that uh, will help kind of the, the back of the eye from degenerating. Yeah. A reds dash two. Yeah, it's the second formulation that's come about. Yes? On the IMT, is that for uh, dry macular degeneration? Yes, it's for dry. Mm -hmm. And the, um, the laser, the DPT, is that for? Yeah, so PDT, photodynamic therapy, um, that is available for more a wet macular degeneration. That's for wet. Macular. That's for wet, yes. And what are the initials again? PDT. PDT. Mm hmm. At Loma Linda, Dr. Rouser, Dr. Michael Rouser, he's the chairman of the department. Dr. Richard Pesavento at um, Southern California Retina Consultants. But that's in Palm Springs. Palm Springs, yes. Can you yeah. Rouser, R-A-U-S-E-R. -E mm-hmm. And then you had a question? Yeah, uh, why would the red, um, the or whatever, sometimes take the red up and sometimes not? Well, it depends on what the red eye is caused by. If it's the engorged blood vessel, then it should. But then, if it's, you know, if it's a serious um, uveitis or iritis, inflammation inside the eye that um, needs to be controlled by steroids or even oral medication, that would be the route to go. Um, so you have to you have to find out what is causing the red eye. If it's just, you know, um, like an episcleritis where it's just the superficial blood vessels that are slightly dilated, then Visine will work. But if it's something deeper inside the tissues, that needs to be addressed with other medications. How quickly does it typically work? Within 10 minutes? The Visine? Oh, yeah. It, it works within 5 to 10 minutes, um, if not instantly. I think I saw another question in the back over there. No? OK. Well, um, any other questions before we do the raffle? OK. So you all have your raffle tickets out. Yes? I was told that my eye had to be suffering from like, dry eyes. Uh -huh. Yes, yeah, and did anybody get the sample refresh drops? Anybody? No? Oh, okay. I did hand some of them out. Um, refresh or sustain are ophthalmologist approved um, eye drops that you can get over the counter. So Walgreens, Walmart, CVS, Rite Aid, Target. Are those for redness too? Um, if the redness is caused by dry eye, <laughs> yes. Okay. You really got to know what you're Yeah, about. you have to know what's going on. Okay. But it's, I mean, it's very common. Dry is, you know, very, very common. Is so. it, uh, now my mom has dry eyes. Does that mean I might have them? Possibly. <laughs> it's not like inherited or anything. It's probably, it's more based on your environment and, and where you are. Mm -hmm. And if you're using those tiers more than um, four times a day, then you want to switch to the preservative-free tiers, which come in little vials because the ones in the bottle have preservatives, and if you keep putting preservatives in your eye, that's gonna build a toxic effect, and that's not good. You wanna switch the preservative free, which the little vials, you just pop off the, the top and use as much as you can. 
You can do it every hour if you need, just whenever you feel like it's dry. Just like lotion on your skin. Yes, mm -hmm. you can. I, I wear soft contact lenses, so I, I just pour, pour that in. I work on a computer. You know, I see patients, and I have to chart on the computer, and I'm going back and forth, and I'm not blinking very much. So it's, I get dry eyes at the end of the day. Refresh, refresh, um, advanced, I think is what it's called. 